Don't be shy out there. <coughs> Question to Mr. Tomachewski. Um, you compare the settlement limitation rates uh, after the Ponderosa fire <coughs> between three treatment conditions, and I believe you said treatment, no fire, no treatment, treatment, the treatment plus tilling. What did the treatment consist of? What mitigations were included in <coughs> the treatment to reduce uh, settlement Okay, well done. Uh, the, there, were, there were two uh, areas that were treated in a different way, and then one that was controlled where we did nothing, left the burn trees there. And on the, on the one, like I said, we, we salvaged the merchantable timber, but we left all of the shrubs in the brush, re recognizing, though, that, as I said, it's all burned up. It's all black. There's no green patches out there on Ponderosa on our ownership. And then the subsurface tilling is essentially a cat with a winged till that goes down six, eight, 10, 12 inches and, and just disturbs that hygroscopic burned over soil layer. And of course, increases the permeability of the water, I think really is what happens. And you do it on the contour, you don't want to go up and down the hill. There is, these slopes are, are 10 to 20% slopes. They're not real steep at all, but they're, of course, they're fairly flat. And then, uh, we, of course, we didn't do it in the streamside zones. You know, you, you can't without, and wouldn't want to without special dispensation. And so there are buffers along the streamside zones. And, uh, and the, the areas that we tilled were the areas above each of the swales. The sediment fence is placed in a swale. And those areas are, on average out there, anywhere from 12 to 20 acres or so. So that's the size and the scale. Now we're gonna come back and plant and plant trees and you know all of the kind of things you do to try to get it going again. Where, I, I might mention on the Bagley fire, north of Shasta Lake, extremely steep ground. I mean, really tough place. Uh, checkerboard ownership, Forest Service, is, it, it's roadless. It's got roads all over it, but it's roadless. And it fell out of rear too, but the current other administrations kind of put it back in. So they didn't want to do much out there. And we really suffered some losses there. Because, and you couldn't predict this, but really steep ground, a really hot burn, and then we had uh, 29 inches of rain in 10 days. And uh, it, it really whacked it, the burned area. Where it didn't burn in the green, even with that amount of precipitation, that looks really well. We tried to get out there after the first, well, actually before the first storm, and do road work and all that kind of thing. And then about $300,000 worth of investment got blown out between the first storm and the second storm, They're trying to just keep things going. But uh, if you fly over Squaw Creek, where it comes into the, to the Shasta Lake, you'll see that there's a lot of dirt down there. If the agency would have known in August that rains like that were to come, they may have reallocated some resources and not let that thing burn. But how do you know that? And, and, and there are other priorities and structures and people at risk all over the state. So, but uh, that one we took a we really took a hit there. Dan, I have a question uh, relative to a comment you made about the, the experiment. Okay. I was fortunate enough to watch Cajun's seminar last week, so I'm familiar with the with the study that Dan is. Dan has alluded to, you made the comment that roughly 50% of either the biomass or the volume of material caught in the fence was organic. And my view of the pictures anyway was that, you know, it's really, the you know, standard placing fire looked to be mostly ground fire so that the trees were combusted. Um, and there wasn't a spot of organic material, you know, forest floor material left. So I'm presuming that that is basically standing slough biomass that's coming off of the standing residual trees due to the storm and then on the ground and then transposing? What it appears to us as a component is that, but also mixed into what was on the ground is, is organic material that just doesn't seem evident. It looked, because I don't know anything, I'm, not, I'm just a forester, looked like dirt to me. But when we analyze that stuff, 40% of it is, is organic material. And most of it is, was deposited on the ground in, in the course of the fire. So it's not the standing stuff that's sloughing off. It, most of it, there's a component of that, but most of it is actually just mixed in with the soil. And I bet a chunk of that's 
basically char. Yeah, oh yeah. So then we're thinking, okay, one, is that even important? Uh, do we care that we know that? Two, if, if, uh, if because, you know, there, there, a lot of it got transported into the stream courses, uh, does that matter that it's organic? Uh, of course it matters in terms of deleterious effects for sediment and all that kind of thing, but, but what should we think about the fact that all this organic material, a lot of it got deposited in the stream courses and then, of course, headed out? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And we're not smart enough or we're specialized enough to, to know what we should think about it or if we should pursue that. But it never really occurred to us how much organic material would be in a burn in terms of impacts because you always think it's all sediment. And it, I mean, it just we didn't know that until we tested it. And we had to do it in a different lab because we don't burn our lab down because you've got to get it really hot to get the stuff to separate from the dirt. So we took it to EPA lab so we didn't burn ours up anyway. Dan, I have one more question on that study. Uh, fascinating study, by the way. It's really heartening to hear that you all are looking at that question. You know, the topsoil issue is so important. Uh, what's your hypothesis, or what's the hypothesis out there, um, maybe I missed it, on why uh, going in and doing the salvage lo logging cut down the sedimentation you know, by a quarter? You know, why it went from six tons down to 1.5 tons after you did the harvest. Well, uh, I, I think because, because again, it's flat ground, so you have tractors or skidders. It broke up that layer, that hygroscopic layer, and it just had more permeability for the rain that did come. So it, it wasn't as beneficial, if you want to use that word, in terms of minimizing sediment transport as the tilling was, where we actually kind of tilled it up. Uh, and again, you know, could the agency even, I'm not putting quotes, get away with that? I mean, would that be a valid prescription on flatter agency ground to till? We don't know. We're able to do it, and we've done it for a long time because of the compaction issue on unburned areas where, you know, we've inherited or bought lands that have been logged on since the gold rush, 1860s. Uh, you know, 30, 40 entries, taking the best trees. Every 10 years, take the best trees, take the best trees. And we have soil compaction issues because they entered sometimes in wetter conditions, particularly in the clay soils. So where we've been starting those stands over, we've been tilling those up, one, because it improves more uh, survival of the little trees, but it mitigates this compaction issue by prior, you know, numerous entries. So that's where we kind of came from. And then we said, well, if it works there, maybe it'll work on these burns, let's try this out. Of course, Lee uh, McDonald was helping us figure that out. Sounds like an LZ from 1968 <laughs> or something. John, trying to, as I go through the forest plan revision and biological assessment, figure out how the Forest Service or others as well are viewing the relationship between the 2004 framework and that, and specifically, in my mind, at least to some issues, there's, it's night and day as to scientific uh, information since 2004, especially as to post fire habitat and things like that that I focus on. And yet, as I watch things play out, that thing is still a driving force. So I'm wondering how we reconcile that. I'm so glad my colleague Don Yasuda walked into the room because I'm <laughs> going to let him answer that or he can say that's that's something that's in progress of being understood. Uh, well, one of the th ways is that, that you know, we've, we've always uh, considered it, but in this case, we're really explicitly going to, to address those, that dichotomy of the two tensions of, of the issue, the need to address the fire deficit that I'm sure Joanne talked about, as well as, um, understand the dynamics of, of the condition today. And so one of the things, and, and thankfully we've, we've got both sides of, of that information on the uh, Living Assessment Wiki now, um, and so it's squarely in front of the planning team. Uh, we will have to address how we're considering these different elements together in determining what we're considering the best available scientific information. And, and as you know, it's not it's not a simple either or, and so the challenge for the planning team and the challenge for all of us is to figure out how we blend the two, the need to create and, and uh, manage for early soil conditions at the same time that we're trying to manage for late soil conditions, and more importantly, the, the, the transition to the dynamics uh, between that 
in a sustainable way over time. And so it's, it's an incredibly uh, intriguing challenge to us to how do we get in the current condition and start moving the system towards our desire. Um, but I think to answer your question, the, the one way we're going to do it differently is, is by very openly talking about that tension and, and trying to figure out what the different trade-offs are of, of different approaches. Um, and, and you'll really see this, not so much necessarily in the assessment phase, but you're going to really see it as, as we start to, to craft different approaches once we move into the, the planning phase uh, and looking at, at uh, plan alternatives. So that's, that's where really we're going to need a lot of creative thought to, to think of what are different potentially workable strategies to move us uh, on different paths. Yeah, and, and you know, each time we do a forest plan revision, we're, we're learning each time as things go. And this time, one of the things we learned, Justin, is that uh, we need to involve everybody in the conversation ahead of time. And it may be that, you know, some people consider it a clean slate. Some people didn't like what happened before. Some people did like what happened before. And, you know, every time it's a continual dialogue. And hopefully this time we do a better job of having the dialogue ahead of time and having uh, people like yourselves be part of it and figure out what the best course of action is that's acceptable. And it's, you know, not everyone's going to agree. And hopefully at least everyone's engaged and we do a better job as the Forest Service of listening and reflecting the best science that's out there in a comprehensive way and giving everybody an opportunity to tell us what is the best science, not just making that determination ourselves. Um, so we try not to beat our head against the wall each time. We try to learn something new and, uh, you know, 2001, I was involved before that. 2000, I was involved with SNEP, 2001, 2004, we're here again. The one thing I hope we have learned is we can't take so long to get these done. We have to move a lot faster, we have to be smarter about it. One more question. So, Joanne, this morning you had mentioned something about uh, the role of fire and, and creating resilient ecosystems or having resilient ecosystems that are resilient to fire. I think another important point to think is, as climate is changing is the role of fire and, and uh, adaptation of these mm -hmm. systems and that we're not, because something does, I think Jay mentioned something, we get two fires in the same place and you start type converting to another type. Um, so I think of uh, in the chips fire in some areas where, um, you know, they're at ridge tops at 4,500 feet. And in 75 years, Chaparral is probably what it's going to be there as the community type, and that these fires are maybe just pushing us, you know, a lot of these trees grew in a different climate regime 150 years ago than is there now, that we have to use fire as a tool for adaptation as well as resiliency. Yeah. Very good point, and one of the chapters that I worked on for the Fire in California ecosystems had to do with the relationship of fire and plants. And one of the things that we know, and, and I'm sure we know less about animals, but the same is true, is that m many of the plants in California, no matter where you are, have some ability to either respond well to fire, they're enhanced by fire, such as uh, aspen sprout better after fire, or some of them may even be dependent upon fire, such as the um, mariposa lily that uh, was rare, California Calicortis clavatus that occurred in the Cleveland burn, we thought it was rare, it may still be listed, I don't know. All of a sudden, after the Cleveland burn, that most people think was a little hotter than we wanted, there were the, the calicortis all over the place, where they have flowers that are um, stimulated by fire. So with climate change, you know, what we've seen that a lot of this, these plants and probably many of the animals that can move can function. It's just what that mix will be. And, uh, you know, I've been part of many interagency processes in the workshop you were at with a lot of different people looking at climate change vulnerability and how we're going to deal with that. And that's probably the hardest thing that we have to address. 
And thank goodness people like you are involved because I'm glad I don't have to address it by myself. So with that, I'm going to close out here. And I'd like to, uh, us to acknowledge our panel. And then we can all clap for you too. <laughs> We didn't have the interactive sessions, but I am very sincere in our interest in your thoughts about this uh, diagram that talks about the human element, the ecosystem services, and the ecological side of things, and what you think about it. And you can uh, put your input on the wiki. You can mail me at the Forest Service. Um, you can email me at the Forest Service. Phone call is I'm hard to find, so I wouldn't try that unless. <laughs> You might make a phone appointment with me because we're going to be using this next month and we really need to find out does this work at all or not and our idea is that this is by issue so whether it's fire biodiversity air quality um, you know other ecosystem services how does this work for us to assess it and understand it so thank you all very much for coming and uh, I appreciate your time, and hopefully we'll do another one later on carbon and air quality and biodiversity, and we'll just keep it readdressing this. Thank you.